Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the po- podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I am your host today, Brian Brew, and I'm joined this episode by Greg Uttinger. You know, the great Julie Andrews once said, behaving like a princess is work. It's not just <laughs> about looking beautiful or wearing a crown. It's more about how you are inside. So, Greg, let's move on to a <laughs> biblical example of a princess. <laughs> oh, well, you know, the Bible does have a few princesses here and there. There's Pharaoh's daughter, who goes unnamed in scripture. One scholar suggests the name may have been Sebek Nefru Ra, because she was a female Pharaoh who's lying dead ended. And that's what happened to this young lady. Having rescued Moses from the Nile, she herself went on to be queen of Egypt. And yet Moses, who be, who was his, her adopted son and should have been the next Pharaoh, he refused the throne, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, the writer of Hebrews tells us. So she rescued him. She funded his education, preserved his family alive. All those are those are commendable things. How much of that was conscious, we don't know. How much was mere sentiment, we don't know. Uh, then we come to Michael, the daughter of King Saul. Uh, she and David fell in love and got married when he was still captain of the king's army. When Saul tried to kill David, she helped him escape. But um, when David ran, she ended up being given to another man in marriage. And when he came back, he took her rather by force away from her new husband. So that was not so cool on David's part. And in the end, she and David did not see eye to eye, particularly on the matter of worship. When David danced in celebration before the Lord as an act of worship, Michael looked out the window and despised him for showing off his body in front of the young ladies. <clears throat> and so and that didn't go. Well, she, um, it cost her David's love and marriage bed, apparently. And then David had a daughter named Tamar. This is a very sad story. She uh, becomes the target of her stepbrother's lust, and though she proves kind and quick-witted and tries to talk herself out of, um, basically out of ancestral rape, uh, she nevertheless falls victim to her stepbrother and and leaves the stage um, a very tragic character, apparently a woman of faith, but a hard, miserable life. Her brother Absalom avenges her, uh, and that doesn't go well for all of Israel by the time it's done, and David doesn't really do anything about it. Then we can think of Solomon's 300 wives who were all princesses. We don't really know any of their names or anything about them. Probably Solomon didn't either. Um, they were mostly political pawns and sex objects. In the New Testament, there's Salome, although she's not named um, in the Bible, but we know her from secular history. She's um, the one who did the seductive dance before King Herod that eventually cost John the Baptist his head. So but the Bible doesn't put a lot of um, special emphasis upon princesses as such. They're human beings. They're children of Adam. They may or may not come to faith in Christ. They may or may not be used by God to do great things. There is one princess, though, in the line of our March of Scripture that we should talk about. <clears throat> She's a lady that most people have never even heard of. Her name is Jehoshaba. She's the daughter of King Jehoram. Now, we can remember um, last time that um, King Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, the southern nation, had made an alliance with Ahab, king of Israel, and his wife Jezebel, and that they had a daughter named Athaliah. <clears throat> and so this, this affinity, this marriage, this covenant involved uh, Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram marrying this Athaliah. But Athaliah was wicked like her mom. She was a Baal worshiper. She was uh, um, aggressive. She was uh, a power hungry, full of ambition. She hated God, the God of Israel. She hated um, the promise of Messiah. She wanted power. And when her husband was alive, she pulled his strings. When he died, she pulled her son's strings, but then God let loose a whirlwind in the north. 
He raised up Jehu, the captain of the host, to come and slaughter Ahab's house. And when Athaliah heard this, and heard that all, her um, son was dead, and half of her relatives were dead, and her mom was dead, she calmly and coolly went into the nursery where her son's children were and began to kill them all, systematically destroying anyone who had a claim to the Davidic throne, because it was her intent to take the throne for herself, establish Baal worship, and rule the way her mom kind of did, or certainly would have wanted to. She was going to out mom or mom. And that's where this Jehoshaphat comes in. Jehoshaphat was the daughter of King Jehoram, Athaliah's husband, but probably not by Athaliah. There's no sense that this was, this was a mom-daughter thing. Most of the kings had multiple wives, and this is probably by some some secondary wife. The the further uh, evidence of that is that uh, <coughs> Jehoshaphat married the high priest, who was actually a godly man. His name is Jehoiada. He does great good for the king of God, as we'll see. And apparently um, Jehoram figured, well, you know, fine. Give, at least he's important. Maybe there'll be a political card I can play later. Let's just get her out of the house. And so Jehoshaphat and Jehoiada apparently were a very happy couple. And Jehoshaphat, as a princess in the royal family, was able to come and go. The temple complex and the palace were right next to each other. So she could come and go as she will. The, the servants wouldn't know her. She wouldn't need special, you know, special password or special ID or anything. And when word came that Athaliah was on the rampage, Jehoshaphat knew she had very little time to act. And the, the scripture doesn't give us a blow-by-blow blow account. It'd, be, it'd make a great movie, as I'm sure it made fantastic and frightening history. But somehow, Jehoshaphat got to the nursery one step ahead of Athaliah, whether the slaughter had begun or whether Jehoshaphat only had time to grab one baby. We're not told, but she grabbed one little baby boy, whose name is Joash. And she grabbed him and grabbed his nurse, and they hid, it sounds like, first of all, in a bedroom closet. And then as soon as the Fuhrer died down and all the other little boys were dead, she managed to sneak Joash out and take him to the temple and to the side storage rooms, probably a second or third floor where nobody ever came without a really good reason. <clears throat> and Baal worshippers would have no interest in going there unless they actually suspected the boy was still alive. And she and her husband, together, with probably minimal help in order to secure secrecy, raised the little boy for seven years. Things we can say about this woman, she, Jehoshaphat, this princess, she was brave. She was a quick thinker. She was not, she did not hesitate to risk her own life. If she'd been caught, she'd been dead. Athaliah would not have hesitated for a second to kill this woman. She and her husband had such a marriage that she would know that her husband would absolutely support her in this, would want her to do this, and would be there for her on the other side if she could just get back to the temple in one piece. Uh, and she believed that this was worth it, that the promise of Messiah, not just the life of one child, as important as that is, but that the promise of Messiah, of the kingly line for descended from David, the salvation of the world was worth this kind of, well, it could easily result in martyrdom. And she took these chances, and then she had no, no prophet came to her, no special revelation, no dream, no angel saying, go and rescue a baby. She was a very bold young woman, and what she did changed the course of verse history dramatically. So there, there's, there's a princess for you. <laughs> um, and we can set her over against all the Disney princesses. I don't know how much time we want to spend with that, but you, you, you know, you can probably come up with some examples better than I can of, of first of the how wonderful Disney princesses are and now how abominable they are and how they're not a fit role model for any young woman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, it was in 2000 um, that Disney executive Andy Mooney made the somewhat obvious business decision to consolidate all the pop most popular Disney princesses into a singular single franchise 
and spin out through it licenses to some 250,000 varieties of Princess merchandise. Princess wow. Lip Balm, Princess Alarm Clocks, Princess Bedspreads, Princess Nighties. That was, and Disney's excuse is, well, there was just this demand and all kinds of people wanted to satisfy it. How is it, is it our fault that it made us billions? <laughs> Uh, maybe not precisely. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a turning of a tide since then. The princesses are, uh, they're drawn in biologically impossible ways. Their clothing is suggestive. They depend upon a man to rescue them. Uh, their authority comes only from the fact that they are the children, the daughters of kings and not because of anything they've done in their own right. It, you, 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 you get the idea. One, one writer, Annie Hines, writing The Atlantic says, the princess trope represented passivity, entitlement, materialism, and submissiveness. And no daughter of mine would wear a onesie that celebrated such lows and values. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we bought much in the way of princess merchandise for our kids, if any, when they were our girls when they were little. They, well, they watched the princess movies as they watched other movies, not to ad nauseum. They didn't watch anything that much. But... Uh, when my my Emily, I've mentioned this before. When my Emily was very young, we were on our way to to church, and I guess the rest of the family was sick because it was just the two of us in the car. And out of the blue, she asked, "Daddy, why does everyone want to kill princesses?" Mm. Which I thought was a profound question from a three or four year old. And so we spent the next twenty minutes on our ride to church talking about the Christian young lady as a as a princess, a daughter of of the Lord and the war of Satan to try to destroy the bride and her children, of which this is an obvious incident. It's a wonderful, a wonderful discussion with a, a three to four year old. Um, I wish I could remember everything I said at the time. I don't know. Do you have any comments on, on this whole thing? Have you experienced any um, princessness yet? Pr princessness. <laughs> uh, not personally. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean? Any I mean, have you run into any criticisms of it or tirades oh, against oh, it? Oh, every every week it seems at least at least once. I mean, there was a there's there's probably a uh, a good stretch of two or three years where it was like every day I would see something about this, uh, just in my travels along the internet um <laughs> from criticizing snow white for having four lines and having a man come and rescue her uh, even worse was aurora <laughs> from sleeping beauty and uh, i think i think it has in general gone down if my own personal anecdotal experience is anything to uh to judge sweeping societal trends by but um, that may also have to do with the fact that in the past, hmm, it's twenty twenty two now. It's probably ten years, fifteen years. There, there has been a, a stronger shift towards making the female protagonists who are princesses more, I guess, dynamic is a good enough word. Which is a good thing. I mean, having a dynamic character, having them grow over the course of a movie is is a very good thing. And I think that is something that potentially was missing in older. Uh, versions mm -hmm. of uh, of such stories, but it does also, I think, fail to recognize that, at least classically speaking and literarily speaking, the the princess is not so much of a character as she is a plot point. <laughs> which yeah. mm -hmm. I I think there are good and bad things about that. There there's bad things where it's like, oh, this is a person made in god's image and she doesn't matter that much you know just put her off to the side she's just the thing that the hero has to has to get yeah um yeah. but i think there's there's good things in recognizing that because if you look at stories as a reflection or mirror of the divine story of salvation then it's pretty true to form that the bride that christ comes to rescue is uh Asleep unto the point of death. Even, yes, yes. As it would be with Sleeping Beauty, and and even with Snow White, uh, as she is drawn she, by an apple into yes. a death sleep. Yeah, she takes a bite from an apple and is, for all practical purposes, dead to the world, living death. Yes. yes. And so, and and again, there's like there is a reason 
typologically speaking and um imagerical speaking whatever <laughs> that word would be mm-hmm. why that is the case and why the princess who is in death's sleep is also guarded by a dragon yes and it takes a prince more than likely a king's only son prince yeah. <laughs> to come and slay the dragon and that's because it's a mirror and an image of the true story. Of course, we can find mirrors and reflections of the true story in other non-princess related uh, narrative arcs. But like this is classic for a reason. And it's not just because we had a patriarchal society that was repressive towards women and didn't want them to achieve their full potential. It's because of this. It's because of the fact that we're the bride of Christ and we all together, man and fe- fe- man and woman, are uh, helplessly dead corpses in need of rescue by a, uh, a divine king. Yeah, we're, it, it's a message the world doesn't like. The, no. the true bride is absolutely helpless. There's nothing she can do to save herself. Yeah. She needs to be rescued. And insofar as we are looking at that particular image, that's, sorry, a valid storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, now, having said that, we can see the the other side of the story. It's it's focused here. We, we're talking about princesses, Well, we can talk about other points where the uh, the enemy comes into the bride's territory. The bride herself has been rescued, but now she is a mother of children, and the bride protects her children. Mm. Either actual children or potential children or children in general from um, the uh, the oppressor, the abuser, the rapist. And one can think here easily of JL. I was uh, gonna say that exactly because <laughs> there there's there's also an um, an aspect in which the bride images the divine work of her husband. Speaking of the metaphorically of Christ in the church, that is. Yeah. And of course, we're going to see that in reality as well. So, Jael isn't just a, a metaphor. She's not just a literary figure. She's a historical figure. She actually existed. She was part of Christ's bride. And she took up a tent peg and crushed the head of a serpent, metaphorically yeah. speaking. So, we we can absolutely acknowledge that, narratively speaking... The princess is normally dead in need of rescue, but in the terms of that story's development, she is able to image and mimic and copy the work of her savior, her rescuer, when additional trials and additional um, dangers come. Yeah, she is. Uh, she, her calling is to be like her husband, to grow up into the image of Christ. Her head. And so, having been saved because her bridegroom has trampled Satan underfoot, Paul turns to the Church of Rome and says, and may, say, may God trample Satan under your feet shortly. Uh, there, mm. there is a place where we pick up what Christ began. He did it definitively. He did what we could not do. But now that we're in him, we can continue the warfare but we always do it in dependence upon him. We we never are so suddenly so full of our power. It's not like Jesus released this potential power that was somehow held back by uh, a thin hair or something, and now our own potential power is realized, and we can go out and slay dragons and take over the world. And no, we're we're absolutely dependent upon Jesus the whole way. Uh, and it is our honor and pleasure, our joy, to imitate him and crush serpents as we go along the way. But most of the time, when those images are invoked, the literary images shift. We're called no longer the bride, we're called an army. Because both are true, uh, depending upon where, yep. where Scripture puts placing the emphasis. But it, the Scripture is not afraid, at times, to give to women a particularly important key role in redemptive history. Now, it is sometimes a uniquely female role. Uh, the most important woman in history, aside perhaps from Eve, is is Mary. And when the angel came and said, you know, God's got something special for you to do, she, Mary didn't say, you mean, I get to be a princess? 
a queen, rule the world, pass legislation. No, wait, an <laughs> authoress, write a book. Uh, a movie star. Yeah, that's got to be it. I mean, they have lots of, in, you know, what, what was she? Mary, Mary, you get to have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Something no man could ever do. In a sense, passive, and yet Mary embraced it willingly with her heart yeah. to become a tool that God would use. That, And again, something no man could ever do. And in the original prophecy at the Garden Gate, God spoke of the seed of a woman. And Adam gets completely dropped out of that prophecy and conversation because Adam screwed it up. Mm. Humanity has nothing to create. Man is dead in trespasses and sins. Which is also something interesting is, you know, a lot of the time you you hear people say, oh, the Bible is misogynistic and it blames women for everything. And it's like, no, it very clearly saw Eve bring the apple to Adam. And then Adam's the one who's on the hook. He's the yeah. one who bears the responsibility. Absolutely. And all women can say, Phew, good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it's funny as a school teacher, not so much uh, lately, but I used to hear some of the younger guys and girls dispute this as to who was really at fault and who was to blame. <laughs> like, guys, <laughs> okay. They both, Adam and he both said, but let's get this straight. The race fell in Adam. The Bible is absolutely clear about this. Yes, it mm -hmm. came from the fall of our first parents, Adam, even paradise, the catechism says. But it does not say that Eve was equally responsible in terms of the covenantal consequences. That was Adam. When we get to, um, 1 Corinthians 15 into Romans 5, the, the fall of the human race is laid squarely on Adam. One man, not one man and his wife, or one woman and her stupid husband, or uh, <laughs> a seductress who lured her husband into doing, you know, and, and, and the old interpretations. Well, Adam, Adam ate of the fruit because he realized that Eve was lost to him, and the only thing he could do out of true love was to follow her in her sins, and it just didn't work out very well. Oh, come on. That is not the nature of sin. That's ridiculous. Um, Adam sat there and watched to see what was going to happen, and uh, how, how, how are you feeling, Eve? Any uh, you know, feeling any premonitions of sudden death or anything? Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll eat it. Sure. Because, yeah, obviously God lied because you're not dead yet. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, you know, Adam was the first um, male chauvinist pig using his wife as a guinea pig to figure out what was going on here. Uh, the woman was deceived, Paul says. The man was not deceived. He knew what he was doing. And so we as males have to recognize that. And yet the woman was deceived. And there are consequences historically for all of that. Uh, but not consequences that make the the woman any less human, any less godly by nature, mm -hmm. or any less potentially useful in God's plan. Yeah. But it does mean that sometimes what the world thinks is useful is not what God thinks is useful. Yeah. God did not put a sword in Mary's hand or a lightsaber. He gave her baby. And the whole world calls her blessed above among women for that. Yeah. There's one other mention of princesses that we haven't talked about yet. This is Psalm 45. It's called the Song of Loves, and it goes like this. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. And this is directed toward the bridegroom, not toward the princess. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty, write prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and acacia, out of the ivory palaces, whereby they have made thee glad. And now the mention of the princess or the queen. King's daughters, those would be princesses, were among thine honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. 
So this is a marriage ceremony. The, the king, the prince, is coming for his bride, and he is a victorious king. He has his sword upon his thigh, he has bow and arrow, he has waged successful war, he has been terrible to his enemies, and he's identified very plainly, and the writer of Hebrews picks up, picks up on this, thy throne, O God, this is Jesus, this is the divine Messiah. But now the camera shifts to the woman. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear, forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So this queen comes from outside the royal family, obviously possibly out from outside of Israel. We're not told exactly, but she is to leave and cleave. She is to leave her father's house, and she is to give herself to her bridegroom. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy lord, and worship thou him. Then we get to hear about some other princesses. The daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. So there are other princesses standing around, Gentile princesses ready to contribute. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of no, the king's daughter. So apparently meaning the king, i.e. prince's father. So she's been adopted perhaps. Language is a little strange. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework of virgins. Her companions that follow her shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children. So the, this princess now become a queen in her own right. Um, is told, get your attention off your ancestors and your fathers and whatever influence they played on you. Focus on your children. Instead of thy father shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. And again, the, the, the word is, start practicing your sword play so you can go out with the king onto the battlefield and have his back all the time. I, I, am, I am not opposed to writing heroines in adventure stories who raise swords and... and fight beside their true love, but that's unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, what Scripture lays out here is the general pattern for the church, at the very least, and thus for human marriage in general. Instead of thy father shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. Your eye needs to be on the next generation. You have the power to multiply your effectiveness, your influence, your faith, your godliness, your commitment to Christ through raising, training up, discipling, evangelizing your own sons who can go out and make a world of difference. Mm -hmm. And that's not a lesser role. Of course, I'm a teacher and I would say that, but that is what the scripture says <laughs> too, that having that kind of effect on the next generation is something that is profound. It is something God blesses and uses. It is not something to be ashamed of or to apologize for. As, as God gives children. And of course, that's something with, that's within his sovereign control. And the chapter ends, I will make thy name <clears throat> to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, shall the people praise thee forever and ever. And presumably that's directed at the bride because she was the last subject and has been for several verses now. This bride will be remembered to the end of time because she faithfully perpetuated faith trust, godliness, covenant commitment into the next generation and the next and the next and the next. Uh, so this, this is not a second-rate role for women. It, is, it may not be what every single woman is called to exactly, but it is a general pattern, and it's most certainly what the church is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. The church in her utter dependence upon Christ is to disciple the next generation, and adopt children. That is, go out and evangelize them and bring them into the kingdom yep. and instruct them, make disciples of all nations until the end of the time, until Jesus blows the whistle and says, game over. Until, uh, as Lewis says, the number that Malaldil read in the mind of his father before the world began is complete. Or, Jesus, the, the, the people you gave me from the foundation of the world, I'm here to lay down my life for them, to buy them back. And that's that's the game. That's that's what this is about. 
And that's what we're about. We cannot be God. We need to give up that attempt. Mm -hmm. We need to give up trying to put ourselves as, as humans, as individuals, as men or women, at the center of the story, as if it's all about us. And we need to exalt Christ. We need to exalt uh, God's salvation and recognize that God uses us, and that's a privilege for us. Yeah. He does not need us, but he's chosen to use us. Um, without his power, there's, without me, he said, you could do nothing. And so yeah. that we embrace. When we embrace that, we're going to be a lot happier about everything. Well, thank you so much for uh, that discussion. Let's move on to recommendations. Uh, well, that uh, discussion triggered in me a thought. Uh, it's something that's come up in other contexts as well. My recommendation is reading the Bible every day. It doesn't have to be lots and lots of chapters, but it needs to be a habit of every day submitting your mind to God's Word, finding out what God has actually said. The American church is horribly ignorant of the Bible. Mm. And uh, I, I see this, for instance, in, in my wife's class. She was teaching... You no, know, she was teaching New Testament this year. I guess she, she was referring back to the previous year when she was teaching Old Testament. And she came to the book of Judges and started telling some of the stories in Judges. And her kids, and these, these are kids who grew up in the church, like, that's not in the Bible. I've never heard that story before. Wait, what happened? He did what? She <laughs> did what with the hair? Why, why have I never heard this before? Yeah, well, that's a good question. <laughs> why have you never heard this before? I mean... I have an answer for that. Um, <laughs> we're very squeamish about telling Bible stories to young children, which we is are. funny because they love them. <laughs> well, see, there's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't love them. Don't they know better? <laughs> yeah, ring the Gnostic bell here. Um, there, ding. Yeah, it's it's anyway. But not only in terms of that, and that's that's one of my normal tirades, but I've become acutely aware of, of people who have been in the church a long time, who are not stupid, but who seem to forget rather obvious texts of Scripture like they were never there and like they'd never seen them. And I think we are all prone to this. We easily forget. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is something that Lewis addresses a number of times. I'm thinking particularly of the silver chair when mm. uh, Pablo Glam and the children are tempted to forget Narnia and Aslan all together and believe it was all a dream and it's all uh, reasoning from our finite experience to some great archetype, but there never was a son, there never was an Aslan, there never was a Narnia. Um, and then also um, Jill, when she, um, when, when, and I've quoted this a number of times lately, Aslan dispatches her to, to catch up with, with Eustace and gives her a number of signs watch for these specific things. This is the path you will follow. When these mm -hmm. things happen, know that you're on the right path. But he warns her, you're up here in my land where everything seems crystal clear. And you want to see the signs, you want to follow the signs. When you get down there, they will not look like you think they're going to look. And therefore, you must repeat the signs when you rise up and when you lie down and when you walk by the way. I mean, Lewis is basically borrowing from Deuteronomy 6 at that point. Yeah, and, and true enough, uh, Jill and Eustace muff all of the signs down to the very last one. The last one, they are able to finally say, "Look, we screwed everything else up, but this is what Aslan wants us to do. It'll probably get us killed." Well, that was Puddle Glum. Yeah, it'll get us killed, but you got to <laughs> do what Aslan says in any case. And and, I, and there's much to be said that for for reading the text, repeating the text, memorizing the text, yeah. having the very words of God in your heart, not just the word generically. Yes, I know that the Bible commands love. Okay, give me five verses, word for word, where God commands love and, and, and describes this love he commands. And if you can't, then there's you, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, same thing with justice. Of course, justice is a, has been a big theme over the last couple of years, particularly when preceded by the word social. Well, what does the Bible say about justice and judgment and law and things like that? Well, can we quote it? Can we at least, can we say, oh, yeah, yeah, I was just reading about that yesterday? Or is, again, are we just thrown back on vague general generalities because we've let our mind flip-flop all over the place and we haven't submitted yeah. it to what the Bible, the words of the text actually say? Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I find it very easy to read an entire page 
not only of scripture, but of anything, but even of scripture. And at the end of that time, we'll come out of a daze and say, wait, my eyes are at the bottom of the page. They were at the top of the page. I obviously have just read a page. I don't remember a thing I read. <laughs> and I go back to the top and read it all over again. Depending on how distracted I am, it may take me a two or three times to get through that. I hope that's not mm -hmm. too terribly unspiritual of me, but uh, it, it, it it is easy just to kind of go over it because it's so familiar and say that you've yeah. read it when you haven't wrestled with what the words say. So, read the I remember, words. I remember um, reading a book in high school or potentially in college. It was sometime in my late adolescence. And if I remember correctly, it was a book about overcoming lust, temptation to lust and things like that. Mm -hmm. He and the ironic thing is that now looking back, I can't remember which book it was or what the actual statement was, but the, <laughs> the thing that wasn't the statement that he he followed it up with is what stuck with me for some reason. He he said something about how essentially, you know, the 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 Lord has given us the spirit in order to help us overcome our infirmities. And that includes in the normal everyday kind of things like um like overcoming lust. And he did a paragraph break. And he goes, now stop. Read that again. <laughs> because either you or Satan himself has tried to distract you from understanding that. Yes. And I always I always think of that. It's like that's it's true. He wants us to remain ignorant of the word while we think that we are not being ignorant of the word. Right. Exactly. And also it's just um it's a human thing when we're when we're looking at something, our like for instance, with the sexual temptation thing, over successive uses, your body becomes used to this, to um, the, I don't even know the chemicals anymore, the rush of chemicals. Right. Yeah. And essentially, on a subconscious level, your body is like, well, this is trying to keep that from happening more. I'm going to distract myself from it, even though yeah. I'm reading it, even though I consciously want it. To go away and to, and to stop that subconsciously, you're you're still fighting against yourself. <laughs> yeah, that, that constant war. Yeah, um, we we tend to make it between body and soul, but it's body and soul versus what Christ is doing in body and soul. Yeah, it's it's all of us against all of us, and the the we need the Holy Spirit. We need the finished work of Christ through His Spirit in us. To win those battles, and and yeah. he's he's chosen to use scripture, to use the preaching of the gospel, and so it is easy to fall asleep in church. It is easy to not hear the words. It's easy to read the words and not process them. One of my jobs as a, as a teacher, you know, I, I have this T-shirt. Read the text. What does it say? My my job is to slow students down and say, wait, what did that actually say? And uh, I, I remember a. Uh, uh, a pastor who I had with whom I had a very passing acquaintance, but he was a good guy. And he told a story of, of uh, working with a young man, and they were reading Romans one seventeen, the just shall live by faith. And he had the young man read the passage. He said, read the passage. Okay, what does it say? What does it say? And uh, the young man looked at it, and he said, it says you got to accept Jesus. No, that's not what, <laughs> that's not what it, read it again. Uh, it says you got to live by faith. No, that's okay, at least you have some of the words right. No, that's that's not what it says. Read it again. The the and I've experienced similar things with not just with teenagers but with older folk. Of no, read the, read the words. What are they actually saying? Because the the odds of you getting it right are are, are less than even. I think oftentimes, uh, reading is a difficult thing because it means that you have to submit your mind to something outside of you. Mm -hmm. And sin does not like that. Our pride does not like that. We 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 want to think our thoughts, and we don't want to slow down and listen and submit to someone else and hear what they're saying, particularly when it's God. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah. So this is read 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 the text. What does it say? And read the text you should be reading a little bit every day. Is scripture? Yep. At the very least, meditate upon it because that God commands. Yeah. Uh, well, my recommendation is uh, less theologically focused, but it is work of mercy. Something that I started doing uh, when I moved out of state uh, was donating plasma. Now, most places will 
pay you for your time at the very least. But the merciful aspect of donating plasma is that um, pharmaceutical companies are able to take your plasma and, I don't know, do some kind of magical spell to it to create <laughs> um, I know you're gonna say that <laughs> life-saving uh, medical mm-hmm. treatments for for people with things like um kidney diseases or um autoimmune disorders and things like that you you help essentially by giving up about an hour and a half of your time twice a week mm-hmm. you can help these companies provide treatment for uh really nasty kind of disorders that are hard to live with and they can't make those things synthetically. Uh Yeah. The, whatever aspect, I guess the hemoglobin in plasma. And I'm so sorry to any biologist listening. I probably just screwed that up, but it, it's not something that they can, they can do apart from the human body making it. Uh, So last year, um, for instance, the United States reached an all-time record low in uh, the, the plasma supply for the for the country, and every place was extremely desperate to get that back up because. Oh, I can imagine. Is the uh, process like giving blood? Is, is they stick a needle it, in you? Or is it more complicated? I mean, on the back end, it's more complicated. For you, it is. You get stuck with a needle just like normal. Mm -hmm. Um, But you can do it more frequently because plasma, your body regenerates plasma quicker than it does red blood cells. Oh, okay. So you can go twice a week and you give 800 milliliters each time, depending Mm -hmm. on body weight. Like the the least you can give is about 700 milliliters. But yeah, it, it basically, it takes blood from the needle, feeds it through into a centrifuge, it spins out all the plasma and then puts it into an offhand thing and then it returns your red blood cells to you and then it does it a bunch more times. Uh, wow. For me, for the 800 milliliter cycle, depending on how well hydrated I am that day, it takes between six and seven cycles. So about 50 minutes total. That's uh-huh. the longest part, but like on a practical level, you have to wait in line sometimes and you have to sure. go through what's called MH. Uh, I think it, I think it stands for medical history or something like mm. that. They take a prick of your blood. They test your blood pressure, your pulse, your temperature. Uh, they make sure that you're healthy and your your blood and your plasma is going to be in the right range for them to use it, and in the right range so that you're not sitting there for three hours waiting for your plasma to come out. <laughs> if you're under hydrated, your blood will not flow as well, mm-hmm. uh, etc. Yeah, there's there's, there, there's about nine factors i think on on the mh spreadsheet and then depending on what kind of medication you're on you you're eligible or not if you have blood diseases you are right out yeah. um etc but anyway um it's it's one thing i do you know it's it's nice because we basically use the the money that they give you in exchange for your time for fun stuff so like we'll mm-hmm. use it for date night sometimes uh, my wife and i and and actually at one point i was using it to fund most of the the home repair in our house cool. um but yeah it on on a more service minded level you're helping out other people it doesn't take that long you know like anything with blood there's going to be a, a risk uh, i think on the sheet there's a risk of like contracting syphilis and uh <laughs> tuberculosis even is yeah, is a weird one weird. so you know if you're immune compromised maybe don't consider <laughs> uh, donating plasma but yeah. i'm going to recommend it for healthy people who uh maybe they want to make a little extra money uh during the month and they want to help people at the same time donating plasma it's a good way to go a lot of the times they'll even have like <sighs> coupons and promotions and stuff like if you're a first time donator you can get like three hundred dollars in a month instead of the normal 200 or something but yeah, it's really good. It's really great. I've had a I've had a good time and, you know, get, getting to know the people there. My wife works there as well. So, um like getting to know her coworkers in a sort of <laughs> weird um setup is it it's it's good though. Uh so yeah, that's my recommendation. And and there is something semi messianic about giving your blood for the lives of others. So. <laughs> <laughs> I I wouldn't take it too far, but yes, there is. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Greg, for joining me for this and for the good good discussion. To your listeners, thank you for joining us. Uh, If you're new to us and you'd like to follow us, you can like our YouTube channel, subscribe there. 
Uh, you can subscribe on Rumble. You can like our Facebook page. Uh, if you want to subscribe through a podcast catcher, we're, we should be on all of them. Uh, if we're not, you can let us know. Uh, if you would like to reach out to us with questions, concerns, criticisms, uh, questions or topics you'd like us to cover in an upcoming episode, uh, you can reach out to us at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. Uh, if you'd like to support us financially, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. A big thank you to those of you who have decided to support us financially. It helps us put the show out and get things going and episodes out to you. So we really appreciate that. And finally, a thanks to David Maxson, our producer, uh, for all the hard work he does getting those episodes out to our listeners. We hope you'll join us next time and have a great one.